Hello, and thank you for joining me for today's webinar, which I hope will dispel some popular myths surrounding family law and clarify some frequently used terms and family law processes. My name is Megan Kelly, and I'm a solicitor at Michael Lynch Family Lawyers. I've been working in family law exclusively for about 10 years and was admitted to practice as a solicitor in 2021. I've worked closely with an independent children's lawyer and I've also worked for a number of years in private practice. I'll let you know a little bit about Michael Lynch Family Lawyers before we get started. I'm proud to announce that the firm celebrated its 25th birthday in 2021. We're a team of 13 specialist family lawyers, six of whom are accredited family law specialists, and we have over 100 years of combined professional experience. We see private clients and provide confidential and professional advice in all areas of family law. For new clients, we offer a fixed fee and obligation free initial consultation to provide the client the critical advice they need to know if they're considering separation or if they've already separated. Today, I want to provide you with some advice to assist your client's understanding of family law processes and frequently used terms and rectify some common misconceptions in relation to how to navigate the separation process. Okay, we have a lot to get through, so I'll quickly rattle off the main topics and then we'll get started. I'm going to start with describing the law, de facto and marriage relationships, time limits, parenting, property, and some family law myths. As I'm sure many of you know, the applicable law in family law matters is the Family Law Act 1975, which is a Commonwealth Act and applies to all states and territories in Australia, except for WA. Back when I was working in family law in 2012, the applicable court was the Federal Magistrates Court of Australia, which subsequently became the Federal Circuit Court of Australia and Family Court of Australia. As you might be aware, in September 2021, both of the courts merged and are now called the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. Please feel free to refer to our webinar presented by Teela Morrison early last month for more information on the recent court merger. The first thing I'm going to discuss is what is defined as a de facto relationship. So a person is considered to be in a de facto relationship with another person if, one, the two parties are not legally married to each other. And I emphasize each other at this point because a de facto relationship can still be in existence if one of the parties is legally married to someone else or if they're in another de facto relationship. Point two, if the two parties are not related by family, and three, if with having regard to all of the circumstances of their relationship, they have a relationship as a couple living together on a genuine domestic basis. Now I hear yourselves asking, what exactly does a genuine domestic basis mean? To determine a genuine domestic basis, the court would consider some of the following factors. The duration of the relationship, the nature and extent of the party's common residence, whether a sexual relationship exists, the degree of financial dependence or interdependence, the ownership, use and acquisition of the party's property, the care and support of children and the reputation and public aspects of their relationship. To recap, in order to prove a de facto relationship, it must be shown that a, a genuine domestic basis is established and that one of four other factors must be present. The four other factors are that the parties have been in de facto relationship for at least two years or that there is a child of the relationship or that a de facto spouse made substantial contributions and a failure to make an order for an adjustment of property interests would result in serious injustice to the applicant or that the relationship is or was registered under a prescribed law or a state under a prescribed law of a state or territory. So the most common scenarios for parties in de facto relationships who come to us is that they've either intermingled their finances throughout the course of their relationship and or they have a child together. In practice, I've not seen many situations in which a person claims that there was not a de facto relationship between the parties. However, if there was such a claim, these are the factors which the court would consider to determine the issue. 
I appreciate that most people know what marriage is, but I will quickly confirm that the Marriage Act 1961 was amended on 9 December 2017, and the new definition of marriage is the union of two people to the exclusion of all others voluntarily entered into for life. The next topic I'll talk about is separation and when separation is deemed to have occurred. As family lawyers, we often face situations whereby the parties disagree on their separation date, which can create real issues for married couples when considering an application for divorce and for de facto couples when negotiating property settlement. However, I'll talk about time limitations a little later on. So separation occurs when one person makes the decision to separate and communicates that decision to the other person. It's important to note that the other person in the relationship does not need to agree for the separation to occur. From that point, one party may choose to move out of the home or both parties may remain living in the home and be considered separated under one roof. Now, moving on from separation, we have divorce and the divorce process. From the outset, I want to point out that the Family Law Act establishes a no-fault divorce system. This means that it doesn't matter who cheated on who or whatever happened to lead to the separation. Either party may apply for a divorce if the marriage has irretrievably broken down and there's no reasonable likelihood that the parties will reconcile. To obtain a divorce, the parties must satisfy the court that they've been separated for no less than 12 months. If parties are separated under the same roof, the applicant would need to swear or affirm an affidavit evidencing that the parties were in fact separated. This might include things like doing their own washing, doing their own washing and cooking, and no longer attending social events as a couple. To obtain a divorce, either of the parties may solely or both of them jointly depending on their amicability, complete an application for divorce. A copy of the marriage certificate will need to be attached to the application and both documents need to be filed with the court. The current filing fee for an application for divorce is $940 unless the parties have a concession card. If it's a sole application by one party, they will need to arrange for personal service of their application and the accompanying documents on the other party or their solicitors. Just on a side note, I recently appeared in a divorce hearing in which many of the other parties were self-represented. I would say 50% of those matters were adjourned to another date before the registrar due to incorrect service of documents on the other party. So it's really important to get the service correct. After the filing of the application for divorce with the court, the party or parties who filed the application will be provided with a divorce hearing date. At the hearing, the registrar will usually ask the party or parties a series of questions in order to satisfy the court of two things. The first being that the parties have been separated for a period of no less than 12 months and there is no prospect of reconciliation. And two, that any children of the marriage are properly provided for. This is not to say that the registrar will discuss parenting matters such as changeover and Christmas. It's only to ensure that the basic needs and financial security of the child or children are satisfied. I note that if there's no children of the relationship, then there is no requirement of either party to attend the divorce hearing because if the court is adequately satisfied, the registrar will make the divorce order on the papers and it will be uploaded to the Commonwealth Law Courts portal for the parties to access. If the parties do need to appear, and once the court is satisfied, the registrar will make the divorce order, which then comes into effect one month and one day from the date of the divorce hearing. Although it is a relatively straightforward process, if there is some complication, such as disagreement about the content of the application or of the date of separation, it can become quite complex and additional documents such as affidavits may need to be prepared. It's always best for your clients to obtain legal advice about applying for a divorce. Now, some of you may or may not have heard of the word nullity. When a party to a marriage applies to the court, for an order of nullity, they are seeking that the court finds and orders that no legal marriage exists between the parties, notwithstanding that a marriage ceremony may have occurred. 
the court may declare the marriage void if one of the parties was married to someone else, the parties are in a prohibited relationship, the parties did not comply with the laws in relation to the marriage in the place they were married, either party was not of legal age to marry, or lastly, if either party did not give their real consent to the marriage because consent was obtained by duress or fraud, there was a mistake in identity, or one party was mentally incapable of understanding the nature of the marriage ceremony. I've never seen personally or been involved in an application for nullity, and it's my understanding that they're quite infrequent. Before I move on from de facto relationships in marriage, I just want to stress that it doesn't matter whether the parties are in a de facto relationship or married for there to be parenting orders made pursuant to the Family Law Act. Okay, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, Certain events happening in family law trigger the running of time limits for parties to apply to the court. In relation to marriage, each party only has 12 months from the date of the divorce order in which to apply to the court for an alteration of property interests or for an order in relation to spousal maintenance. For de facto couples, the parties have a period of two years from the date of separation in which to apply to the court for an alteration of property interests or for an order in relation to spousal maintenance. So you can see why disagreements about the date of separation can cause issues if a party is trying to apply for a divorce or if they're arguing about whether or not the two year time limit to apply to the court after the breakdown of a de facto relationship has lapsed or not. If either time limit does lapse, the parties will first need to apply to the court for leave or permission of the court to apply for an alteration of property interests out of time. To be successful in an application seeking leave to apply, the party seeking leave will need to explain to the court the delay in instigating proceedings and satisfy the court that they or a child of the relationship would suffer hardship if the court did not determine the matter. I'll now move on to a little bit about how the court considers parenting matters. In determining a dispute under the Act concerning children, the court must consider a number of factors relating to a child's welfare. The overriding factor for the court to consider in any dispute concerning children is set out in Section 60CA of the Act, which states that the best interests of a child is the paramount consideration. The family court judges have a wide discretion in their decision making in framing an order which they consider best suits the child's best interest in a particular case. In determining a child's best interest, the court must consider the primary and additional considerations set out in section 60cc of the Act. The primary considerations are firstly the benefit to the child of having a meaningful relationship with both of the child's parents and secondly the need to protect the child from physical or psychological harm from being subjected to or exposed to abuse, neglect or family violence. In applying these primary considerations, the court is required to give greater weight to the consideration of the need to protect the child from physical and psychological harm. I encourage you all to look up the additional considerations which the court must consider, which are contained in section 60 CC3 of the Act. Under the Act, both parents of a child who is not 18 have what is known as parental responsibility. This means that both parents individually have all rights, powers, duties and responsibilities relating to their children, which no other person has. Section 61DA of the Act provides that when a court is making a parenting order in relation to a child, the court must apply a presumption that it is in the best interests of the child for the child's parents to have equal shared parental responsibility for the child. This is not a presumption about the amount of time that each parent spends with the child. If the presumption of equal shared parental responsibility applies, then both parents are required to jointly make decisions about major long-term issues, including schooling, religion, a child's health, a child's name, and changes to a child's living arrangements that make it significantly more difficult for the child to spend time with the parent. For example, moving a child interstate or overseas permanently. 
It is important to remember that neither parent has more power than the other parent in relation to making long-term decisions. Unless the court takes away equal shared parental responsibility from a parent, then both parents continue to have an independent and equal say in major long-term decisions concerning their child's welfare. I note that the presumption of equal shared parental responsibility will not apply in some circumstances. These include if a reasonable grounds to believe that a parent or other person who lives with a parent has engaged in child abuse or family violence, in interim hearings where the court considers it inappropriate for the presumption to be applied, when the application of the presumption is not otherwise in the child's best interests. I'm sure you can all appreciate that this is a very sensitive and emotional area of law and the process and relevant considerations in relation to children are very complex. Okay, I'll move on to property matters now. Since the court merger in 2021, the court has attempted to streamline family law matters and has introduced a new pre-action procedure in an attempt to lessen the volume of matters ending up in the court system. There are now five pre-action procedure steps for property matters. The first is to invite the other parties to participate in dispute resolution. If a party is wanting to commence court proceedings, they must give a copy of the pre-action procedure brochure and the pre-action procedures from Schedule 1 of the rules to the other prospective parties and invite them to participate in dispute resolution. The second step is for each party to agree on a dispute resolution service and attend the service. In order to do so, they must make a genuine effort to resolve the dispute by participating in the dispute resolution. In relation to property matters, we recommend that parties engage in negotiations by setting out clearly to the other party the issues in dispute and what disclosure they are seeking, if any, and if the circumstances allow, proposing a genuine offer to settle the matter. If a property settlement agreement is reached, it must be documented properly, either by way of a consent order or a financial agreement. If documented in this way, all transfers of property between the parties are exempt from stamp duty and receive a capital gains tax rollover relief. Additionally, and perhaps most importantly, the act of documenting a property settlement in this way has the effect of drawing a line in the sand with regard to financial matters and in all but very few specific circumstances, permanently severs the financial relationship between the parties. The third step is that if no dispute resolution service is available or a person refuses or fails to participate or agreement is not reached through dispute resolution, the party wanting to commence court proceedings must give the other party written notice of their intention to commence court proceedings and attach a copy of the pre-action procedure brochure which sets out the issues in dispute, the orders to be sought if a case is started, a genuine offer to resolve the issues, and a nominated time frame, which is usually at least 14 days after the date of the letter within which the other party must reply. Step four is the reply to the notice of intention. If a notice of intention is received, it must be replied to in writing within the time limit provided and must state whether or not the offer is accepted. If the offer is not accepted, the party receiving the notice of intention must set out in a letter to the other party the issues in dispute, the orders to be sought if a case is started, a genuine counter offer to resolve the issues and a nominated time frame, also at least 14 days after the date of the letter, within which the other party must reply. If no response is received, the initiating party's obligations to follow the pre-action procedures ends and they can now instigate court proceedings. Following on from these topics, we do have an information sheet that's very handy for more information and detail on these topics and the matters that I've raised. It goes over the five steps that the court considers when determining financial matters. It also touches on formalising the agreement by way of consent orders or by a financial agreement. 
and it also has there listed the time limits and time limitations for de facto couples and for married couples when applying to the court for alterations of property interests. If the pre-action procedures are unsuccessful, a party may have no option but to apply to the court. If this becomes necessary, see from the diagram in the slides the listing pathway. After filing an application, the matter will be listed for a first court event. This will be listed wherever possible on a date between one and two months from the date of commencement of a proceeding before a judicial registrar. At this hearing, the court usually makes orders for things like disclosure, financial documents and other and property valuations and property valuations. The next step is an interim hearing if required, which will be listed at an appropriate time having regard to urgency and the need for preparation or any required expert and other evidence. The third step is a dispute resolution event such as mediation, a conciliation conference or family dispute resolution as appropriate, which is to be completed either within the court or externally as early as possible and, and usually no later than five months after the date of commencement of a proceeding. In our experience, mediations are often very effective and many matters settle at this stage. For matters which result, which re, for matters which remain unresolved following dispute resolution and are not allocated to the fast track hearing list, a compliance and readiness hearing will be listed following dispute resolution and as close as possible to six months after commencement of a proceeding. If determined appropriate by the allocated trial judge, a trial management hearing will be held prior to the final hearing and subject to the parties complying with relevant orders and directions, a final hearing will be listed on a date earlier than 12 months from the date of filing. Finally, after the final hearing, the court will endeavour to deliver judgment to the parties within three months of completion of the trial. The risk with litigation is that the court has a discretionary power to make whatever orders it considers appropriate in the particular circumstances of the case. It is not confined to simply deciding between your proposal and the other party's proposal. Each case is determined on its own specific facts by the particular judicial officer hearing the matter. The court is made up of different judicial officers such as judges, senior judicial registrars and judicial registrars each exercising their discretion and having different powers to make orders. Obviously, judicial officers are people with their own thoughts and views, therefore two different judicial officers who have relied upon the same facts, the same evidence and applied the same legislation could arrive at different answers and not be found to be an error. To finish up, I thought I would quickly debunk some common family law myths that we experience regularly. Myth number one is that many clients we come across believe that because they are separated, any property they obtain post-separation cannot be touched by their ex-spouse. This is untrue. All property of the relationship, including assets, liabilities and superannuation, form part of the property pool available for division between the parties up until such time as there is an agreement between the parties or court orders are in place. There is a four step process to determining a just and equitable division of property between parties, including post separation contributions. This means that if one party purchases a real property post separation and prior to any property settlement, then that property will be included in the asset pool available for distribution between the parties. However, when determining a just and equitable division of the asset pool, each party's post-separation post contributions will be considered. Essentially, the property would be included in the asset pool, but depending on the facts and circumstances, it doesn't necessarily mean that the other party automatically gets half or gets a chunk which is often what clients believe. The four step process to property settlement is a complex topic, which we won't have time to discuss today. However, I encourage you to register for our upcoming webinar on property matters, which I'll talk about at the end of this webinar.
as you may have noted from my comments on parenting matters earlier, the court is focused on the best interests of the child, not the parent's right to see the child. There's a very big difference. Essentially, if it is not in the best interests of a child to spend time with their parent, for example, if there's any form of risk factors, etc., then the court will consider those factors with greater weight than the court would give to any perceived entitlement the parent may believe they have to spending time with that child. It is incredibly sad, and we see it all too often, that parents feel entitled to their children just because the child is theirs without recognising that their own behaviour during the time they spend with the child may not be in the best, may not be in the best interests of that child. Many people also often believe that if they pay X amount of child support, they are automatically entitled to X amount of time spent with their children. This is also incorrect. Parenting matters and child support are considered separate issues in family law matters. Essentially, child support is payable to assist the financial costs of raising children that a party helped create. Financially contributing toward the cost of raising a child does not buy time with them, so to speak. The time a child spends with a parent is determined by the best interests of that child. I would like to thank you again for joining me for this webinar. We thought this was a great opportunity to explain some common misconceptions in family law and hopefully answer some questions which you, have, which you may have had. If you have any specific questions regarding any of the topics that I've discussed today, please contact our office by using the details displayed on your screen. We will send around a feedback survey after the webinar today, which you can use to specify any questions or comments about today's webinar. We really appreciate any feedback that you have. If you are interested in or would like to know more about specific areas of family law, you can view past webinars on our website. They cover a range of topics, including property settlement, parenting matters and children, relocation issues and specific webinars for accountants and counsellors. We also have other helpful resources on our website, including articles and other publications. I would also like to mention our upcoming webinar on the 30th of May, specifically in relation to property settlements. I'm sure it'll be very informative and interesting for you and your clients. If you, are, if you have any suggestions about topics that you would like to see covered in future webinars, please let us know. Otherwise, as always, if your clients have gone through a relationship or marriage breakup, and they would like specialist family law advice, we're more than happy to speak to them. Thank you again, and I hope you've enjoyed today's webinar.